right, all right. Hey, praise the Lord. So good. Just speak the name of Jesus. He's the one. He's why we're here and we worship him. Uh, go ahead and turn to Proverbs. You, you can see that. We're in the book of Proverbs, and today we're going to talk about wisdom uh, for families. I'm going to use the word households because this is a word for everybody, regardless of your household, whatever that looks like. Uh, if you're a single adult, if you're a teenager, if you're a child in, in the house, this is for you. Okay, got a word for our kids today. Got a word for our singles, young and old. We got grandparents here. Okay, and some of you walked in the room. You don't know where you are. You have, we're glad you're here. Okay. We, we hope that God will speak into your heart, already, already has been. Um, Han led us early on with what I think is the central verse. If you haven't been with us, all of Proverbs, we know it has something to do with wisdom, right? And, and, and it says this in Proverbs 9.10. Let's read this together. Let's proclaim it together, all right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. It all starts with him believing that he exists. Okay, that's foundational. And believing that he created us. And so he kind of knows exactly what the purpose of our lives are. Last week, if you weren't here, go and listen to the sermon from last week. Travis um, preached a great sermon. I preached in the, in the sanctuary, Rolando. We all said this. When it comes to decision making, and some of you are making some key decisions in your life. Listen to the message because we said what's key is that you understand every micro decision is, is tied to the macro purpose of your life. A lot of times we don't start there. And a lot of times we forget what's up. And we go every single day and we get, and we get anxious about decisions and we get confused. And we, oops, made a bad decision. It's so critical. You know this in your work, right? Whatever the mission is, whatever the main thing is, everything needs to tie to that. And so we said, when it comes to life, the question is not so much. I get this question often in different iterations. What is God's will for my life? You know, pastor, I need some guidance. I, want to, I need some peace here. I need some understanding. There's a question before the question. The better question is, what is God's will? Full stop. Like, what is he doing? Let's talk about that. Now let's talk about this micro decision. Every decision should be tied to his purpose for you. And we noted last week, his purpose, if you've accepted Christ in your heart, if you've received the grace of God, um, your purpose then is to glorify him in all things and to be conformed into his image. How will this particular decision help me to be conformed into the image of Jesus? And in the same way, I, like I did a wedding this past week. And I always sit down with a couple, and yes, why do you two want to get married? Let's talk about that. There's a better question. Why marriage? Why does anybody get married? What's the purpose of marriage? And as we approach the family today, the question that we'll answer, what is the purpose of the house, the household, the family? If you live with roommates, if you are maybe you're a college student, maybe you have, you're in an apartment or a condo or something, maybe you're in a house with others, wherever, whatever your family looks like. Some of you have like mom and dad at home, maybe you're a single parent, we have mom and dad at home with kids, maybe there's grandparents. Back in the you know, ancient uh, Far East, uh, in the ancient Middle East, the, they had, you had multiple families often living in the same house. Things have changed. We've moved away. We're not always as tight as we see in Scripture, but the principles still apply. Okay, so we're going to dive in uh, Proverbs 24. Listen to this. Here's a foundational verse. We're going to be in Proverbs 23, but it says this. By wisdom, a house is built. All right. By wisdom, a house is built. And by understanding, it is established. All right. Its foundations are laid. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Isn't that what you want? I mean, like parents, all of us are in your household, where you live. Don't you want precious and pleasant riches to be filling up the house? Now, we know he's not talking about architecture or construction. He's talking about the building of a household. Let's talk about how a house is built, how a wise household is built. Proverbs 23, we're going to be in verses 22 through 26, just a short passage. I'm going to jump to some other cross references, but 20, uh, Proverbs 23. Today you're going to see that wise households, if you take notes here, um, wise households are devoted to truth, okay? We're, we're devoted to rejoicing. Okay, that's a word we don't use often, key in the household, and devoted to one another. Each person in the household. First, wise households are devoted to 
truth. It all starts in the home. Look at verse 22. It says this. Listen to your father who gave you life, right? And do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Okay, now, it is critical as we start that everyone here recognizes the fact that the home, your place where you live, it is, is the core and root of your life. It is the central place. Now, some of you might be, well, of course it is. Well, what, what happens in the home, say it this way, what happens in the home doesn't stay in the home. Meaning, whatever's taking place in your household is what drives you out into every aspect of your life. What takes place in the home guides everything else. Now, he mentions father and mother. I want to I just kind of chase a, a, a very important, chase a rabbit here for a moment because I want to speak to all of us here, but I want to speak to this thing of, of marriage. I want to speak to our seen single adults today because Proverbs is primarily written for the single adult. I mean, if you're here and you're single and you heard like, you're, oh, we're going to talk about families. Dang, I came on the wrong Sunday. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about marriage and I'm single. And, and I get that. That can be a real challenge. But the Proverbs were written for you. The Proverbs were written from a loving father to a son is what this is about. So teenagers, young people, yes, every one of us here. Because what can happen in the church, because we have such, the Christian vision of marriage is so high, so much higher than any other religion, that what can happen in the church is single adults can sometimes feel, because I, you know, I know this, talk to you, and some of us have felt this way, like you come to church and you guys are talking about marriage and you're talking about kids and families and such. And we are all about families here. But what can happen is, um, in the church, especially, I think, sometimes we can even idolize marriage. Meaning, like, some single adults could come to believe, well, the goal is marriage. Like, ultimately, you get married is what you do. And, and that's not the goal. Marriage is not the goal. And in fact, next week, we're going to talk about friendships. Because here's what the Proverbs speaks to. The proverb speaks to deep, abiding relationships, companionship. It speaks to life-giving, very close, intimate, personal, uh, transparent relationship, truth-giving relationships outside of marriage. That's what's critical in our lives. Yes, right relationship with husband and wife. But many of us are struggling in our marriage because we don't have friends outside of marriage. We don't have deep friendships that should be guiding our lives every single day. I mean, I praise God for the deep friendships I have, longtime friends I've talked about often that I am still connected with, that, are, that bring accountability and, and instruction into my life. And if I just come to Stacy and say, would you please fill up every relational you know, hole in my life, I, I'm going to crush her. Because she can't bear the weight of my needs, nor can I her. And what happens in marriage, oftentimes that's the case. But single adults, hear this. Hear this. You are complete. This is every single person in here. You are whole. You're integrated. You're fully loved, fully gifted. You are enough without marriage. The goal is not marriage. The goal is to honor God with your life. And, and, and it starts there. Or you're, we're not ready to enter, you know, ask somebody to come join us into this world. I say it often. I, I spoke um, with our OTC crowd, young, young adults on Tuesday, talked about, listen, if you're trying to, if you think that some other person's going to fulfill a need that only God can fill in you, then you're wrong, first of all. And you're, and, and, and you're not fit to ask someone to become one with you. Can't happen. And, and so what we see here in, in, in Proverbs, though, here's what might be surprising to you. The challenge towards single adults in Proverbs is primarily who not to marry. Like, don't mess up. In fact, throughout the Proverbs, it says that. Because what happens is, you see, we all know this. Marriage, scripturally, marriage is between one man and one woman for life, devoted to each other. But what happens is oftentimes we don't bring Christ right to the center of it all. Understanding that I have been given the grace of God. I'm totally forgiven. So I can now love freely. 
uh, another, another person. I enter into marriage. Marriage is the union of two good forgivers is what it is. Because I have been forgiven, Jesus tells us. I, I can, I've been forgiven much. I can forgive others. So marriage becomes this gospel reenactment. Okay? Uh, it's what Paul says in Ephesians 5. We talk about this often. But um, it looks like Christ and his love for us. Wait, what, he, he died on the cross for us. And so gospel reenactment in the home. And if kids come along, they get a front row seat to that. Look at mom and dad, how they love each other. This is how Jesus loves us. And like food through the body, I mean, it comes straight to the kids. More than what you say, yes, what you say, but how you live. But watch this. There's counsel for every single person here regarding marriage, and it's this. Look at, look at Proverbs 21, 9. You can see it there. It's better to live alone in the corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome wife in a loving home. You have a spacious, giant house. It's better for you to be up in the attic all alone by yourself than to be in that kind of relationship. Now, now, it says quarrelsome wife, and this is how it's going to play out. Because he's, it's a, right, a father speaking to a son, okay? So this applies to the quarrelsome man. Watch this. Proverbs 25, 24. It's better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Like, okay, the attic. No, you, need, you ought to be on the roof. Now, watch this. You catching this drift? Proverbs 20, 21, 19. It's better to live in the desert than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman or man. You catching the drift. Here is the summation of wisdom for the single person in Proverbs. It's better to be anywhere than in a binding relationship with someone you don't love. And once committed in marriage, you are in. Here's the summary of it all. Don't mess up. Don't marry the wrong person, which is why it's such a critical thing and why we seek to help people. We're so committed to marriages here. Many of you know we've got this nearly wed uh, program where you can come and say, I don't know. I don't know if I want to marry him. And, you know, I don't know about that. And we're like, him? Like, really? And, you know, but no, we give guidance, direction. And then we have a newlywed class, which is amazing. Like first year of marriage. A class that takes you to a connect group. Then we have um, connect groups for, you know, as you, as you grow in your marriage, we have marriage core, helping, you know, good marriage, get better. We have, we have counseling at the center. We have, we're here for you. We want every marriage to flourish and to grow. So the primary relationship, you know, this in the household, if it's in this nuclear family, is the husband and wife. Again, some of us, we're not, we have roommates or we live with others or we're at home in this season. But I want you to get back now. Okay, I told you I was going to chase that. Proverbs 23, back to it. I told you there were two ways or two things that he's really referencing here. First is that he, ref, he references the primary relationship. Okay, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. All right, young people, listen to this, children. Notice it references father Okay, who gave you life, mother when she is old. This is interesting. It's not so much talking about um, the ages of the parents. It's, it's actually referring to the lifespan of a child. Okay, so throughout your entire life, you honor your father and your mother. You listen to the wisdom that they bring. I was on the phone with my mom yesterday, bringing wisdom into my life. And constantly, look at verse 23. What does this look like? Buy truth. Okay, buy it up. Accumulate it. Hoard it, if you will. Do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. So truth is qualified as wisdom, we said, as applied knowledge. Okay? Uh, instruction, this is like direction for life and understanding. This is the ability to comprehend to think deeply, to have empathy and tolerance, able to forgive people. Those are what the, those Hebrew words really mean. This is all built on God's foundational plan that we see way back in the law, okay? It was like 1300 BC, Moses. And he brings the law, Deuteronomy, a second giving of the law in Exodus 20, verse 12. You know this. This is right at the heart of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land of the Lord the Lord your God is giving you. He's saying, if the, if the family is strong, then generations in a society will be strong, right? Honoring the father and mother in an ancient Near Eastern 
world was a big deal. In fact, so big, it was at the center of all of society. I don't know that we can say that in our, in our world today. We, can't, we should say it in our Christian homes. We should be able to say, honoring mom and dad is central to everything that's happening here. And, and of course, it, it implies mom and dad are honorable. But, but you, you might know this. The fifth commandment, first four commands have to do with our relationship with God. The last five have to do with our relationships in society, how we're to live in the world. The fifth one is the transitional command. It is the hinge point of all of life. What happens in the home then is sent out into the world. And this is a parent-centered model of a family. Kids are in no place to guide the home. Some of us have kid-centric homes. Parent-centered families, mom and dad are in charge. We're the ones running the show. You're not. Okay, stop. Mom and dad are talking. No, we're doing, you go over there. You're not in control right now. You don't run the show here. And yet a lot of us, I know we can feel this way. Like some of y'all are listening to this and parents here. You're like, well, gosh, our schedules are, wow, we're going to that. They're going to that thing and that. They've got the games. We got the, I feel like my kids are driving the show, running the show. And oftentimes this can happen, but not in terms of the spiritual life, what takes place in the home, what's talked about, what the focus is. This little verse shows us that the home is supposed to be the the place every single day, in every stage of life, in any era of life, any time period. The home is central and the honoring of the mom and dad is right at the heart of it all. So what is the purpose of the family? Here it is. The purpose of the family. It is a repository. It's a storehouse. The the home is is a collecting, central collecting point of truth, right? Truth is told. It's like a bank is what he says. Buy it up. Fill up the vault. Let's store up. Accumulate it. The home is the place where it all happens. And all of this is based on the ancient wisdom of God for Modern times is what we've been saying, right from the Ten Commandments. And some of you know, now here's a verse I want to look at, or a passage, because it's central. What did this look like in, a, in an ancient Near Eastern life? At the heart of it all was Deuteronomy 6.4. You might know it's called the Shema. And it says this, hear, O Israel. Now that first word we've noted, hear, um, the root is, is to hear and to obey, same word. Because in the Hebraic mind, to hear something from the Lord was to obey it. If you didn't obey it, put it into action, you did not hear it. So only in the modern West can we say, I believe that, I'm all about it, I I believe that completely. doesn't have any impact on my life whatsoever. We've got this dualism going on. In the Hebraic mind, it was, no, 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 no. Wisdom is applied knowledge. If you don't apply it, you're a fool, is what the writer says. Look at verse 5. It says, in the, again, we're in, we're in Deuteronomy 6, and it says this, the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is where Jesus, you might remember, he summed up the law right here. And then he added, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because you're going to love God with everything you've got comprehensively, and you're going to love others as a result, here's a great motto for your family. Here it is. If you don't have a motto, like for your family, this is like, like your shield or something. It's this. Love God, love people, do stuff. That's it. Like you can, you can run with that. Love God, love every person in the family, love people around you, love people and do stuff every day and do that. Verse uh, six, it says this, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. The heart is the center of life. It's the core of our lives, right? Okay, now watch this. Verse seven, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk about them when you sit in your house. Now watch this. The household is the center of it all. So when you sit, where? In your house. When you walk by the way, What is that? So when you walk away from where? Your house. When you come back, where? The household. The house is the center of it all. And when when you lie down, where are you going to lie down? Your house. I mean, if you're not laying, if you're lying down somewhere else, that's awkward. Like, I don't know where where you're lying down. In the hospital, I guess. 
Maybe you're on a beach. I don't know where you're lying. You lie down at the house, like going to bed is what that's about. When you rise up, where you rise up? In your house. Your household is the center. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, the commands of God, the truth of God. And they shall be like frontlets, like on a, like a, like a headband. Okay, they could be right there, on your, right between your eyes, right in your mind. You shall write them on your doorpost of your house and, and, and your, your gates. The word of God should be all over your entire house and everything you do. And now, a lot has happened since about 3,000 years ago. Namely, uh, Jesus, the Christ event. His life, his de- perfect life lived for us, death on the cross for our sin, his resurrection, proving he is uh, conquering death and hell for us to follow in resurrection as we receive his grace so we now can live forgiven, not by our works or anything we do, but because of his account for us, perfect account. So we're totally forgiven. We receive that grace. And now the gospel drives everything in the home because it drives everything in our lives. See, look, your house is the place where the gospel is central. It's talked about. The fact we're forgiven, what Jesus has done for us. We never forget. And we, we speak the name of Jesus in our homes. Your house is not just a safe place. should be that. Your house is not simply a place that's where I pursue my hobbies. That's where I do my stuff. Your house is not where you show off your stuff. Your house is not simply a getaway. It's not just your property. The household is a public garden. Here's the image. Where God's word is planted, it's grown, it's cultivated, sown into our lives. Here it is. Your household is a seminary. Literally, a seed bed where the seed of the gospel is planted, it's watered, it flourishes into every life that shows up in your house. That's what the house is. That's what the home is meant to be. Is yours that kind of place? Does that describe your household? That's the challenge God is bringing to every single one of us because it can be that. So see, the truth is is that the core component of the household is truth. But it's not truth alone. And here's where I want to shift. Spend a lot of time on that first point. Wise households are devoted to rejoicing. Because truth without grace is just a beatdown. I mean, it, it can be used as a weapon. Grace without truth is just sentimentality. And it doesn't, it just affirms us in our flaws and doesn't change us. Grace and truth is the way of Jesus. Grace and truth are prominent in the home. And here's what I want you to see. Not just truth. Wise households are devoted to rejoicing. All right, again, a word we don't use often. It's so key. Verse 24. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who who bore you rejoice. Every parent in here knows the pride of a child. Not perfect kids, but those who grow up. I'm so grateful. I read that, and I'm I'm thinking of my own son. I'm like, yes, yes, how I love him so much. And I'm so grateful. I rejoice in him. I rejoice in my girls. You know, rejoice that they love the Lord. But look at this, glad and rejoice. Those two words four times in these two verses. And it's not that we don't have problems, but the Christian home should be the most joyful place on the planet because of the joy of the Lord, because we're forgiven. But how, how would many people describe the Christian home? You tell me. Is that the perception? Maybe strict? Serious? Judgmental? Not fun? Not joy-filled. Some people think that the church is kind of that way. Not here. Not here, friends. The joy of the Lord is what guides us. We come to worship him. The gospel brings joy to every aspect of our lives because we're set free to love. If I am totally forgiven, I say it often, all the love I need I found in him. 
so I can love you for free because I don't need any love in return. On my best days, it's just grace upon grace. And if we do this in the home, certain days, I need grace from you. I, I, I need faith today, and I don't have it. I need you to have faith for me. I need you to follow after the Lord today because I'm struggling. I am sad today. I need you to lift me up. This is the household of faith. This is what God's purpose is for us. Wise households are devoted to truth. We're devoted to rejoicing the joy of the gospel. Okay, And then thirdly, wise households are devoted to one another. Every member is committed to each other. Look at this verse 26. We'll close with this verse and then I've got a little application for you. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. This is so powerful. You, you give somebody your heart. I'm devoted to you. I'm going to give you my heart. Son, give me your heart. Trust me. Watch this. Your heart will guide your eyes and your eyes will guide your body. This will come into play later. When you're staying away, don't set your eyes on the adulteress. Don't follow after the temptress. Don't follow the lazy, the drunkard, all those that are named in Proverbs. Instead, give your heart to him. Your children, watch this. You can see it here, are, are watching you. You see him? Watch me, son. He's saying, do as I do. Not just as I say, do what I'm doing. And then I know all of us, um, none of us are perfect parents, right? But this should be the motto of every parent. Do as I do. And then watch this. When I fail, because I will, watch me. Watch me apologize. And watch me say, I'm sorry. Watch me forgive. Watch me receive forgiveness when I mess up. Watch me. This is the power of parenting. So as we close, I want to offer this. I've got a resource for you, and it's online. So you're going to have to keep this in mind, challenge each other. I'm holding a PDF of what you'll see. You can find it on our website. You can find it on your phone. Um, you go to, uh, you can see there, go to our sermons, okay, media to sermons, and then find your way to our sermon response guide. Every week, this is out there for you to go deeper into the word. You're like, I, I don't know what to do in a quiet time. Here it is. Go deeper into this message. And what you're going to find there this week is 10 traits of a healthy family. I want you to print this off. Put it on your fridge, okay? Because this will be helpful. I just want to offer real quick what this is about. I wrote this years ago when we still had kids in the home. It's kind of a rule of life when I thought, let's figure out, here's what we do here. Let's be clear about our, our mission as a family. Number one. We have an irrational commitment to each other, each member of the family. We show illogical amounts of love. We, we, we have stunning amounts of grace that, that are in our family. That's our goal. That's our hope. Forgiveness is shared with every member of the family and quick. Secondly, and I have verses around all these. We, co we communicate with truth and grace. We've talked about that. Mom and dad model in Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. And we have conversations about things regardless of how difficult it is to talk about. Thirdly, we affirm the value and uniqueness of each member of the family. Every person is unique. And they are loved for free and without judgment. Opinions and feelings are shared and they're always honored. Number four, we've, we vow never to abuse, shame, control, or intimidate one another. There will never be any, any emotional, verbal, or physical abuse. will never be tolerated in our home. It's not going to happen. Fifth, we share a strong spiritual foundation. The gospel drives all of life. And parents, listen to this. Every, every parent needs to hear this. Every wise parent knows a mild dose of the gospel will not do it. Not in this world. Never. Kind of show up at church a little bit when it's appropriate. Maybe, you know, if we can. And you come here and gain from a former youth minister. I'm telling you, come to church. We're all about it. Let's worship the Lord. Go home. Not talked about. You don't pray together. Mom and dad don't talk about it. That will jack up your child more than anything. You're giving them something that is not the gospel of grace. And it's not what Jesus intends. And again, we don't do this perfectly, 
But friends, we've got to make sure at home that we are teaching and talking about Jesus. That's where it happens. Number six, we teach respect for others, and it starts with us, okay? The point here, racism, arrogant superiority, or disrespect for people who are different than us is not tolerated, and it starts in the home. Number seven, we instill a sense of responsibility in one another. Every member in the family has responsibility. Not just dad, not just mom. Stacey and I have talked about this often. We, we had our kids helping early on, but we wish we'd started even earlier. Even earlier. You know, like preschoolers need to be clean. Pick up your toys when you're done. I mean, preschoolers can help. Put, hey, put that towel in the dirty clothes. That's good. That's how you do this. Everybody has something. And everybody faces consequences when things aren't done. Right? Like the Lord does us. Let natural consequences take their place. So you give kids, hey, you can choose to do this, or um, if you don't, then you're choosing to do this thing, which is going to be in your room. Okay? Like for, you're going to be, or we're going to know, we're going to take your phone. Whatever the thing is, let it be clear and let, let's build responsibility. Number eight, we play together. Now, I, I, I give our family pretty high marks here. This is so important. Laughter and joy is rejoicing over the love of God in relationships. Number nine, we celebrate rituals and traditions together. It gives family a sense of constancy and permanence with whatever's going on in the world. Kids can say, okay, this is going to happen this year, and this is going to happen next year, and the year after that, we're going we're to do this again because family is constant, and, and the family will never change. In terms of love, you might move away, might change, but you continue to love each other. And then finally, number 10, we seek help when we come to an impasse. When we realize we need help outside of ourselves. And, you know, Stacy and I have had great mentors and friends. I remember um, our middle school twin girls um, at home and it, a lot of drama. And we, we said, you know, we need some help. We need help. We need some wise counsel. We need to know how to guide our, our children. And so those are the 10. I, wanna, I want you, that's my big application for you as I close, is to go find this and, and print it off, okay? So as we close, I'll offer this. Jesus summed it up. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he lived, lived that out perfectly. The perfect son of the perfect father now invites each of us into his family. So when you come to the Lord, and if you've never given your heart to him, if you just imagine this again. We come to the family of God, perfect father calling us in and standing at the front door, coming out to greet us is our perfect older brother, Jesus, who says, I've already lived the perfect life for you because you couldn't. There are no perfect families. There are no perfect parents because there aren't perfect kids. Actually, there aren't perfect kids because there aren't any perfect families because we're, none of us are righteous, not one. We all need a Savior who's rescued us from our mess. We can have hope because he does change hearts. And there's coming a day, whatever your family looks like, where he's going to make all things right. He's going he's gonna to correct all the wrongs. He's going to redeem everything. And he is going to, to make all things as he's intended. So we can have hope. We can trust in him every single day. So I challenge you to do that. Let's, let's pray together. What is the Lord saying to you? I'm not going to pray a prayer for you. What is he calling you to do right now? Tell him. If you have never received Christ, I just challenge you, could it be now? Would you say yes to him? Jesus is inviting you into his home to be a part of the greatest family ever. It's God's vision for you to be in his family.
Some of you need to join the fellowship of the church today. This family of God here in this place. Maybe that's it. What is he calling you to do? Tell someone. How are you going to apply this? If you're married, tell your spouse. Tell your kids. Maybe your child. How are you going to respond to this message? Lord, we thank you for your great vision of the family. And I pray that we will live it out. What happens in the home spreads out into our lives, into the world. So we give you our households. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen and amen.